Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's forum, No One Is Illegal, What's Wrong With Mandatory Detention? This is presented by Refugee Rights Action Network, and as the name suggests, we're a refugee activist group based in Perth who call for an end to the inhumane refugee policies of the government. I will talk more to the end about some of these and what you can do about it and, and what you can do to join in with some of the things that we do to oppose these policies um, locally. My name is Cindy Nancaro. I'm an activist with RAN. Through my engagement with RAN, I've had extensive contact with refugees, both in and out of detention, including in offshore detention places. I visit re refugees at Yonga Hill Immigration Detention Centre at Northern regularly. Um, I'm also completing a master's um, that relates to the way refugees are represented in Australia, so I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Our first speaker today is Sarah Ross. Um, she is one of our media representatives as well as a key refugee networking activist. This is a crucial role in our organisation. It's very important to us to be in close contact with refugees and Sarah maintains with links with refugees and activists all over the country. Um, she has visiting, visited in many detention centres and among other things will speak tonight about the effects of detention on the refugees she has met. Our second speaker today is Asad Hurani, a Hazara refugee who has had first-hand experience of detention in Australia. We are honoured to have him speak to us today and share his experiences with us. Asad works for PBS, Humanitarian Settlement Services, and he donates a lot of his time to working with refugees, um, the youth and in the wider community with squatting activities and so on. We are also especially grateful tonight, as some of you may have heard, there was another bombing in Quetta overnight. Um, some friends of, of Assad were injured and it's a very, very difficult time for him and so we're very grateful that he's, he's still willing to speak to us tonight. So thank you very much to Assad. So, <laughs> so um, let's start by welcoming Sarah. Um, I'm going to keep it relatively short and casual so we can sort of have a bit more of question time at the end. Um, so I first got involved in the refugee campaign when I was 17, which is only three years ago. Um, I, was, <laughs> I, I remember this endearingly because I was quite like a shy 17 year old. I had just finished high school and there was this group, Refugee Rights Action Network, and they were taking this bus to Leonora Detention Centre, which is in the middle of the desert in Western Australia. And I, for some reason, got on this bus. It was a bit, it was a bit hit and miss. And this bus full of people that I had never met before, but uh, they turned out to be incredibly lovely. And um, it was a huge learning experience. So we drove into the middle of the desert, and um, in the bus ride, people shared stories about their experiences in detention. We arrived at the detention centre, where basically we staged a protest. And while we were there, there was parents holding up their kids over the fence. Um, so their kids were waving us over the fence and people had signs saying, please help us. Um, this was my first visit in detention. And I visited two women from Sri Lanka. Um, during our protests, one of the women smuggled out a letter, which was just basically heart-wrenching. And I still remember to this day, the last five lines of the letter were, please help us, please help us, please help us, please help us. And that was the first experience I got with Serco, the private operator that uh, runs the company, which I now have a very love-hate relationship with, with my continued visits and detention. Um, my next convergence was, uh, so basically after this, I started coming to RAND meetings and getting more involved in the campaign. And I then attended the Curtin Convergence, where we took another bus to Curtin Detention Centre, which is near Broome and Derby. It took a number of days um, and basically, you know, part of these experiences seeing that how remote detention centres are, like they're literally in the desert and the police had erected a removable fence on the road so we couldn't even see the centre but I was one of the few that got to drive in and as we drove in there was like 300 men just sitting on the floor uh, in the midst of a hunger strike. So, you know, that was quite emotional to see that here were these people locked away that no one knew about and they were starving themselves. They were basically so desperate that they weren't eating. 
So uh, the next convergence was at Darwin, in Darwin, where we went to Darwin Airport Lodge Detention Centre. And uh, I remember visibly at this convergence, I was standing against the fence and there was a 16-year-old girl talking to me. And there was sort of, there was this fence, you know, with barbed wire on the top and this green mesh. And there was two policemen on either side of me and there was a guard on the other side. And this girl is sort of trying to tell me that like she's self-harming, she cuts herself, she's been in detention for a year, she's got no parents, she's her 10-year-old sister's sole provider. And it was this really sort of upsetting experience of her trying to tell me this intimate, private thing that she's really struggling and she's having to, you know, do it quietly because there's like these armed, these armed men surrounding us. And it was, it was absolutely heart-wrenching. Um, I returned later to that centre to visit her and you know, heard other emotional stories in there. And then uh, last year, Yonge Hill Detention Centre was built in Northern, and I visited that detention centre basically every weekend for the past like seven or eight months, I think, mm -hmm. which again has been an experience. So for people who haven't uh, visited in Yonge Hill, it's like surrounded by these huge metal fences. Um, so you walk into these metal fences and you go into a reception area where all of your stuff goes in a locker, your bag goes through a security screening and you walk through an x-ray. And then you walk through a series of cages into the visitors room. And it is just like this awful, awful place. It looks like a cross between a hospital and a prisoner's visitors room. It's got linoleum floors, the whole room is white. They have black leather couches and basically tokenistic pot plants to try and make the room look nice and the windows are covered in these sort of mesh wire things. So it's a very sort of tense, uh, sterile environment. Um, some people were in there for a really long time and so I visited them obviously every weekend for the time that they were in there. And that, you know, it's hard because the longer people are in detention, the more their mental health deteriorates. So seeing people who are at first happy, they're happy to see you, they're joking and they're laughing and then each week they get sadder and sadder and sadder and sadder. And they're asking questions like, why am I here? What did I do wrong? And you simply don't have answers to them. Um, you know, and something about you know, being in detention, it destroys people. And there's a combination of those things. Um, you know, one element is Serco. A lot of the guards there uh, haven't had a tertiary education. A lot of them are 18 and 19 year olds who their first job is as a security guard. And there are some people in there who just go on these power trips where they just like to, you know, abuse people. So part of visiting, you know, did reveal how, just how bad mental health and detention is. So people coming out, you know, with scars on their arms and they're desperate and it's like you can't actually, you can't do anything because what is causing their sadness is detention. And you can't make it better because to make it better, you, they, they need freedom, they need to be out of detention. So that has been something I think like the visitors group has had to struggle with is that we're watching our friends basically increasingly harming themselves, becoming more desperate and we can't do anything about it apart from campaign against mandatory detention which is something that we passionately do and continue to do so. Um, in the black broader scope, just a few events I wanted to touch on that have happened in detention. So in the past year in Darwin Airport Lodge, which was the centre that we you know, staged part of our protest at and I visited in before, um, a nine-year-old tried to overdose on his mother's painkillers. A 19-year-old tried to hang himself. More recently, a man hung himself in Wickham Point Detention Centre. Um, a man recently died of a heart attack after being pulled in from the community into detention. And basically just the stress of being pulled back in caused him to have a heart attack and he was left on the ground for an hour before an ambulance was called. Um, in Yonga Hill, one thing that we've discovered recently is that each week about 70 people will be told they're being given, being given bridging visas and then at the last minute on the day they're meant to be released, about 30 of them will be cancelled, which obviously is absolutely heartbreaking if you're waiting for this moment to get out and then suddenly it's cancelled and one man had a heart attack from this. And this isn't, this isn't like, you know, this is quite regular, like the stress of being in there, you know, can, it has physical effects on people. Um, Recently, I went to Melbourne, and many of the guys I visited, I stayed in their homes. So, you know, having friendships that come out of detention, which I suppose is the only, like, the only good thing that comes out of it. 
and I mean hearing people's stories about things that are going on back home. So you know, like last night I had friends ringing me saying that there's been this bombing in Quetta. It was right across the road from my family's house. I'm really distressed. Um, so you know, saying that there, there's real problems that they're fleeing from, and the worst thing is that they're safe. Like they're in detention while this is happening to their family, and they can't do anything about it. And we put them in a position where they can't provide for their family. So. Yeah, basically, it destroys people. And that's <laughs> okay. uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Asadullah Karami. Most people cannot pronounce K, but you can say Karami, it's fine. <laughs> and before going on the mental illness of the detainees in detention center and the impact of detention center, on the mental health of asylum seekers and refugees. I would like to address the issues and the reasons that why refugees are coming to Australia or to some other countries or, and seeking asylum. And as I'm from Afghanistan and I belong to the uh, minority ethnic Hazara people, I would like to give you some information. There might be some of you that you do not, you might not have uh, uh, information about who are living in Afghanistan or what is happening over there. Like I came across to an incident today, like I was trying to send some money for my family and from Western Union it came back to me after a half an hour uh, process on their system or the computer, whatever. They came back to me, they said, well, excuse me sir, you have to stay here on hold because uh, you're a suspect that you're uh, supporting the Taliban in Pakistan and the receiver's name has come as a Taliban leader uh, who is my brother. And then I, I had to be there for one hour until the security people and the investigation, everything is processed and then they come take the Western Union and globally. They came back and tell me that, okay, uh, we are sorry but it came up on a pop up on the system that you are supporting the Taliban and you came up as a sus, uh, suspect because that you are born in Afghanistan and you are supporting some people in Pakistan. So that that was the reason that I was born in Afghanistan. I wrote it on the form and I, I I'm sending the money to Pakistan. That was the reason that I was a suspect. But in fact, there was not a, a message on the system that he's a suspect. It was the the feeling or the approach of that person to me. So basically this this is a basic thing, it doesn't really bother me because it has happened to us a lot and it happens to us daily so we're getting used to it and also there I would like to give you some information about our history, who we are and where to, we belong to and uh, why are we coming and seeking asylum today. As I said my name is Asadullah and I, I'm happy to be called Assad. Uh, we are from Afghanistan. Afghanistan is in Central Asia and Middle East. So 95% of Afghanistan's population is Muslim and we also have Hindus and Christians and atheists over there. Uh, the minority Hazara in Afghanistan, our people, we are the indigenous people of Afghanistan. We belong to that land. And we have, uh, we are a very multicultural country like Australia and some other countries in the world. Like we have different tribes, we have different nationalities over here, we have different cultures and we have different religions. We have Pashtuns, we have Tajiks, we have Uzbeks, we have Hazaras, we have Hindus, we have Baluchs and we have Pashais. We have, it's a very multicultural country. But the indigenous people of Afghanistan is the Hazaras. Hazaras have a life, an existing history of 7,000 years old in Afghanistan, which is existing in central Afghanistan, in Bamiyan, Gore, and Ghazni provinces. So these are the major three provinces and states in the, in a, the country that our histories are still existing over there. And our history is famous by the joint Buddhas of Bamiyan, the Shamawa and Salsal, and the Silk Road. Silk, well, Silk Road was open for trade and business in the region. It was thousand years, thousands of years ago. And also the joint Buddhas, the first one was built, was made in a uh, scratch on the mountain uh, 2,500 years ago, and the second one was 1,700 years ago. And we have another lying statue 
and Afghanistan that was uh, made a couple of thousand years ago. It has been discovered. It is, it is existing over there, but due to security and, and safety of it, they're not going to show it to the public. So over the history and the conflict in Afghanistan, it began uh, centuries ago when Islam came to our region. Hazaras were Buddhists at the beginning, and then we were converted and we, were, uh, we accepted Islam as our religion. So when Islam came to the country, we had refugees coming to Afghanistan, and we place, we give accommodation, we give place, and we give house, homes to the asylum seekers, to refugees, whatever it was in that time. So this is what the history says, and we have very real and fact histories that are written and remained from the past because a lot of our histories have been stolen. When the war and conflict and the fight began in Afghanistan, it is current Afghanistan, but at that time, thousand years ago, it was called the land of Arakosian, which is also um, in the old and ancient books of histories. And there's a new release book of history called the uh, it is called Sirajul Tawarikh. It means the a brightness to the history. Sirajul Tawarikh Afghanistan. It means a brightness to the history of Afghanistan. Like Afghanistan has several names. It changed from that time until now. Whoever comes and rules, they're changing the flag, the currency, the name, and the constitution, the language for their own favor. We were ruling in Afghanistan for centuries, and then when the conflict starts between the Buddhists and Islam and the Muslims in here, after a, a, while, a while after this conflict and the war and the battle between these two groups in the country, they are signing a peace negotiation to say, okay, the Buddhists were still ruling. They said, okay, it's the history. You live in this country, I live in this country. We both live as brothers and sisters. But after all, a while when Islam, uh, the Muslims are increasing in the region. So it comes to some kind of clashes between the Muslims and the Buddhists again. And due to the increasing number, like before that, we had uh, Alexander the Great went to Afghanistan to the uh, Hindu Kush mountain, Hindu Kush mountain. That time, Afghanistan or the land of Arakosian was pretty big. It was not only Afghanistan, but there were many other places and countries that belong to the uh, to our region. So step by step, due to these conflicts and clashes and the war between the religious groups in here, it increases and it goes on for a couple of hundred years. And then they're settling again in here. After that, the massive coming to the recent history in 1800. And the recent history is that the king of the Rahman, who was ruling Afghanistan, part of the negotiation and part of the deal was that Hazaras had taken over the army and the king was on his, in his own place. And then we, the Britons come to the country. After the Britons, after the Afghans fought with the Britons, so they were due to all this kind of politics and policies that was uh, existing before, they're fighting the British troops over there, and the British are going out of the country. And then the conflict in here starts between, between the army and the government, or the king. So with the assistance of the neighbor, neighboring countries like Iran, Pakistan. Pakistan was not existing at that time. It belonged to India. And half of Pakistan belonged to Afghanistan. And it comes, the major conflict is starting here again, that the king, with the assistance of our neighboring countries, they persecuted and they killed 64% of the Hazara population in Afghanistan. And now if, when we go back to the history and to the uh, books and to the websites, it says that 62% of the Hazaras were killed, like women and children were sold as slaves to India and many other countries. Um, and then, um, the current population of Hazaras in Afghanistan is 9%, and there are also many other reports and letters and books which are against our tribe or people 
in Afghanistan because the fear came to the king and to the people, to our enemies, that if we let these people to exist and improve, one day they will take over this country again. The reason, the main reason for our genocide and for the killings of Hazaras from that time until now, until last night, the re most recent one was last night that killed over 30 people and injured over 70 per people. And the death toll is increasing every time when there's a blast. Now the reason behind these killings and the reason that why are we getting killed is we are Hazaras and we are Shia Muslims. So, like there are many other Shia Muslims in the world, we have Hazara Shia Muslims, we have Pashtun Shia Muslims, we have Arab Shia Muslims, we have like uh, Indian Shia Muslims, they're all Shia Muslims, but the target comes exactly on the Hazaras and the governments in Afghanistan, even in Iran, which is a Shia state, in Pakistan it comes back and says that it was an incident, it was a Shia killing, but it's not a Shia killing, it's a Hazara killing because mm. they're killing us because of our identity, because of who we are and because of what we have. Half of Pakistan, almost half of Pakistan belong to our country, to Afghanistan. The main conflict is this, Duran line, that the only nation in the country that oppose, that are saying that we do not want this Duran line to exist anymore, it has to come back to our country because it is our right in our land, in our, our forefathers' land. We need our land back, we need our rights. Standing for our right is one of the main reasons that we are getting killed. So, now these are the issues because now I'm giving you some examples of the major killings that have uh, occurred in Afghanistan, Pakistan and Iran against our people. The one which was 64% uh, of our population was killed by King of the Rahman in 1800 century. And afterwards, there was another one in Zawal province of Afghanistan that land is very famous by Kandipush. If I, I was traveling on that uh, road as usual because that was part of, that was the route to my, uh, to our patrolling areas. We were patrolling those areas every now and then. And whenever that you travel that way, you can see the bones and the skeletons of people on the roads even, there are all the Hazaras because the Taliban, they executed uh, thousands of Hazaras in there. And after that, there was another massive massacre and killings that in 24 hours, in less than 24 hours, uh, they killed 15,000 people in Mazari Sharif in northern Afghanistan when the Taliban attacked that place. And before that, there was another killing, massive killing in Afshar it was a big genocide that I have witnessed that with my own eyes. That I, I was there and I saw everything. They were uh, taking the children from their mothers, from their parents, from their siblings and putting the gun inside their mouth. The, the children were thinking like it's a brace or it's the milk or the feed and they, they were shooting the children like that. And uh, they were cutting the breast of the woman and they were beheading the children and uh, uh, everyone. And I was in a hiding and I was seeing everything. So that was going on. And people, some people managed to hide and escape during uh, overnight when it was dark. And I was one of those, I was lucky to escape with my family. So my family had escaped and I was left behind with a couple of other people because there was not enough room in the truck. And then um, after this, we migrated to Pakistan for a safe, uh, safer home. And uh, the same thing has been going on in uh, Pakistan as well, as you can see, like since uh, the beginning of 2013, they have killed over 600 people and they have, like there are many killings every day. Every day there is killing, every day they are killing Hazaras and every, wherever they catch them, on the highways, if they're traveling, if they're working, if you travel to work, you come back from work and then you're going out for shopping, the school children, they, uh, we have a lot of schools in Pakistan and Quetta because we have a population of 8,800,000 8, Hazaras in Pakistan, including the 
Pakistani Hazaras and Afghan refugees living there. So they have hosted the Afghan refugee Hazaras as well in the, the community. Like they're killing the, the school students. And on January, they targeted a snooker club, a, a recreation center. They killed over 100 people. They wounded 280 persons over there. It always comes in the media that like there were 20 people, but in fact there are, if it says 20, they, we get the latest report because all families are being affected by these things and all friends or all relatives and family members are getting killed. We know the exact uh, number of casualties and deaths. And the most recent one was last night that they attacked, they were trying to attack a mosque where, where people were praying, but uh, they, he was stopped, the sofa bomber was stopped by the Hazara guards. The police had led them to come in. The police, the department of police, and there's a video, uh, a press release by the chief of police of Koita. Like, we knew that there is going to be a blast, uh, there's going to be an attack. The Hazara community will be uh, under attack, under fire, under an explosion tonight, but we couldn't stop it. When the Sosa bomber comes to the police checkpoint, they're telling him, okay, you can go with his rickshaw, the, 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 like a motorcycle carrying a couple of passengers. And then it comes to the Hazara checkpoint and they're trying to uh, prevent the attack and then he's going to switch it over there. These are the main reasons why people are fleeing this uh, situations and coming to Australia. Well, coming to Australia is not easy. It's very expensive you have to pay a big amount of money. And there are many people, even they don't like your money in yourself, they're saying, I'm not going to risk my own life for you. So that is a situation. When we talk to the smugglers, take me out of this country. First, they don't, they don't want to do it because it's a risk for their own life. Secondly, if they want to do it, they want a big amount of money, that we are paying them the money because our people, they in, in, our, on, in our entire history in those countries, even anywhere in any history, in any part of the world, we don't have a Hazara criminal who have committed a big crime. We don't have a Hazara suicide bomber. We don't have a Hazara terrorist. We don't have a Hazara anti-government force. We don't have a Hazara anti-human rights. We respect all religions. We respect every culture. We have welcomed people in our own land. We have given them sanctuary when we had these things. We gave people who were in need, who were seeking asylum and who didn't have a shelter, we provided things for them. But today, since a couple of hundred years ago, until now, we are under attack and we are under fire and we are being treated as even not human beings. So I, don't, I haven't seen people that they have treated animals like that, that they are treating us in our neighboring countries and also on to the transition routes to Australia. Coming to Australia, we have to pass, get through a couple of countries. We have to come to Pakistan, Iran, Dubai, Turkey, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, some are going to Papua New Guinea as well. And then they will end up in Australian, on Australian shore or on, in Christmas Island. Coming from all these countries as an illegal person. Actually, a person cannot be illegal, a person <laughs> is a human being. And the other thing that I'm, I'm very concerned, and I'm, I'm just thinking about it, and I wish I was not talking here tonight, and I wish we were not here for this discussion tonight, and I wish I was not talking about my people, uh, what I'm talking about now, because I wish if we were not refugees, we, have, we were living in our own country without all these problems and killings and bloodsheds. But it, we are in that stage now, so we have to fight for it. And I thank you very much for supporting us and supporting the refugees and asylum seekers. So coming from all those problems, they end up in detention centers in here that I was on a boat in 2010. On April 2010, I, came, I, I arrived in Australia on Australian water on a boat in port 139 YER. When we arrived here, we were taken to Christmas Island. We were there for a couple of weeks, for nearly two months. After the initial processing, we were moved to Curtin Immigration Detention Centre in Western Australia, a couple of thousand cases away from here. We were kept there for one year. 
during this one year we experienced a lot of things and I saw many things over there. I have seen bloodshed, I have seen killings, I have seen people getting beheaded, I have seen people that the terrorists and the Taliban were taking their skins off in front of my own eyes and I have seen people that they were cutting their ears and taking out their eyes because I was uh, uh, captured by the Taliban on two occasions and I saw all these things in front of my own eyes. It, that, that was a very horrible, that was a very difficult situation. That I can never forget what was going on and I saw I witnessed, I witnessed the Afshar massacre, the genocide and the killings of thousands of people, thousands of people over there. But the detention center is a different feeling. It gives you something, it gives you a different lesson. When you come to a detention center, even if you are in war, if, even if you are witnessing all these things in front of your own eyes, but you are still free to run. But when you end up in getting locked in a detention center or in a jail, like most of these asylum seekers and board people that they are arriving to Australia before getting into Australian detention centers, they have, are going to be in other jails as well. Like before, for my, I'm giving myself an ex uh, me as an example. But I'm not talking about me, 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 but it's about in general all the asylum seekers, not only Afghans. So they're getting jail. They're getting locked up in uh, uh, Malaysian jail, in Thailand jail, in Malaysia, uh, in Indonesian jail. Some of them are passing away over there. No one knows about it under the torture and things. When it, they capture people over there, they're telling, "Okay, you're a terrorist." Simply, like they told me, "You're a terrorist. You have to be here for a couple of years." I went to the court six times, and after six times, I engaged in. A lawyer and I proved that I'm not a terrorist so I was deported when I came back. They were experiencing all this tortures, trauma, the jail, the beatings, the hunger and all the problems over there and they have an expectation they're saying okay we're going to Australia, Australia is a country that they respect human beings and they have sense of humanity and they have human rights organization, human rights organizations over there that they are defending from the rights of human beings but unfortunately, I'm not complaining actually. When we come to here, we end up in a detention center. We come across to people that we want to talk to them. We don't want, we, we have no demands and no needs. We just want to talk to somebody over there. Uh, but they're telling us uh, it's illegal to talk to you. Like, this was a very bad feeling for myself. I approached a couple of people to talk to them just to know about Australia, what's going on in the outside the fence. But they, were, they told me, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you. I said, what was the reason? He said, uh, they said, it's illegal, it's against the procedure and the law to talk to you as uh, an asylum seeker. So this is a, a, a trauma, this is a torture. And uh, I came across people that they were self-harming themselves just in front of me. They were cutting their necks, their chest and their muscles. I asked them, why are you cutting yourself? They said, uh, I cut myself because uh, I have no other choice. I, w I want to join my family. I want to show my sympathy and my, my uh, condolence to the people of Kuwait or Afghanistan or Iran or Sri Lanka or uh, other countries that they were there. And uh, one early morning I was going to I was going for a short walk and I saw a Sri Lankan man that he, wa he was trying to hang himself on the tree and then we tried to rescue him. But, so before we rescued him, he was like half gone and half alive. By the time the official, the administration officers, the circle and the immigration people came over there, it was too late. But if, we, if I wasn't there and if we, the people were not coming to help him, then he was gone. And, and every two, three meters, they have got these cameras, they have the CCTVs, and they have the barbed wires, they have the electrical wires that if you touch it, you will die. So you have to, they have that control over there. But when something happens, there's no one to help. And um, there was a gentleman who was living in my block. He had uh, heart problems. And then uh, one evening, he died of heart attack in front of us. And we were, the circle of uh, <coughs> officers in immigration with respect to their duty and line of duty and the, their responsibilities. 
they were not allowing anyone to help. We had a couple of doctors uh, among the solemn seekers that they, they said, we know how to treat this person. We can give him life, but they were not um, permitted to approach that person. And then the ambulance came over. It happened around 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and the ambulance came when it was dark after dinner time, around 8.30, and they took the body out to the hospital. So that is another one. And then I, I was teaching uh, computer classes in English uh, over the detention centers voluntarily to the uh, asylum seekers. Uh, one of my uh, students, he came up to me. He said, I have been waiting for my, uh, for the, from the outcome of my status or visa or the interview for two and a half years. He was moved from Christmas Island to Sydney Sugar Detention Center, then to Darwin, then he was moved to Curtin Immigration Detention Center. He said he doesn't really know what is going to happen. He's been waiting for the last two and a half years. His father has been killed on the way to from Afghanistan to Pakistan, and then his mother died of heart attack. His sisters and his wife and his children and his brothers are left alone, and no, there's, he doesn't know what's happening with them. He had never, he had not heard from them for a couple of months. Like he was thinking that they must have passed away. They must have been killed or shot dead, and then. After this discussion, three nights after that, uh, th sorry, three days after this, we heard, I was in my room and we heard a big noise that, help, help, help. When we went out there and I saw that this guy has killed himself. So this is all about the torture, the trauma, and the problems that they have back at home. And they are locked in here, they are in a cage, there was, um, a very young boy over there, he was saying, a cage is still a cage, if, even if it is a golden cage. Mm -hmm. So you're in a cage, even if it is a golden cage, even if you have the best meal in the world, you're still locked up, so you live here. You have nothing outside in the house, you can't do anything outside. So, and then we had Mr. Tony Abbott come to the detention center, Mr. Uh, Chris Bowen, the Minister of uh, Immigration, and then we had the UNHCR ambassador for Australia and New Zealand came over there. We had a couple of people, uh, the Green senators came over there. So we were raising these issues with them, and the Australian uh, military and the police, they visited this detention center, and the communities were coming and going all the time. We were raising these problems with the people, but Mr. Tony Abbott, seeing 1,800 people in Curtin Detention Center, and they also had the reports from the medics, from the doctors, from the nurses, that these things are happening in here. But his message from the people of Australia, from the Australians and from the communities was that, uh, he stood up and I was interpreting for him. He said, I have a message from the Australians, from the communities of Australia, that we do not love both people. So pass this message to your friends and relatives to tell them you have the telephones in here, you have the internet, the emails, the computers. Tell your friends, your families and your siblings not to come to Australia by boat because we don't love boat people. Australians hate boat people. He said this and I'm one of those, and I was his interpreter then in the air. And our message to the Australian, we said, okay, could you please pass our message to the Australian people before knowing, before knowing about people, before judging about board people, so you have to know who is a board people and why are they board people in here. We raise the same issues with other senators, the ministers, and the human rights activists that they, they've come in. Red Cross was coming here regularly, but there was no progress until, uh, until we had a hunger strike for three days and three nights. And then there were some people, they came from Canberra and they, they told us something and just went. So my, I just want to conclude in here because I've been talking too long, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the impact of detention center on mental uh, health of asylum seekers is not only inside detention center. It, when they're released from detention center, they are still having that trauma, that flashback and the stress because it, it remains there for a lifetime. It goes and comes. It affects their whole life. It affects their children. It affects their wives. It affects their parents, the whole family, even if they're not uh, in Australia, they're living overseas. It breaks up people. 
people feel broken in here, and people, we have a lot of them in, or communities in here that they are suffering, but they don't know what to do. So we as human beings have to help each other, and we have to spread the message of love. We have to song petitions, and we have to raise our voice through what, any possible source that we can to help each other as human beings, not as Australians or Afghans or Sri Lankans or Iranians or Pakistanis. Uh, only as human beings. And I thank you very much uh, once again for listening and sorry for taking too long and thanks for my support. <laughs>
not only that, but it enables them to control the dialogue around them, to tell people it's okay, they're just economic migrants, they're not in danger. Um, and, and they are frequently miscasting refugees in this way. So those from Sri Lanka are often subject to being miscast as economic migrants. And we saw Bob Carr the other night in his interview on television um, saying, oh, things have changed. We know now that people who are coming are economic migrants. They're not really fleeing torture. And so, and so if they're being found to, being ref to be being refugees, then there's something wrong with our process and we need to change the definition. And so this is very, very disturbing kind of stuff that they're trying to do in terms of the discourse. It, when, and so when people are, una are unable, asylum seekers are unable to mix within the community, to talk to journalists, to meet people and tell their so story, essentially to become real and human to our community, the government and the opposition can cast them as shallow, gre uh, sh shadowy, greedy invaders. And others' tropes such as queue jumper, illegals and terrorists, I mean, this is well known to us. Another key role of the detention centre is that of allaying the fears of those amongst the public who need to believe that Australia's borders cannot be breached, who believe that when unarmed people fleeing outrageous human rights abuses and danger to their lives crossing those amorphous watery borders is a threat to our safety and an affront to our sovereignty. So the responses of the government is to say, oh, they're not really here yet. The detention centre is cast as a borderland site. No matter where it is on Australian soil, successive governments have very effectively created them as border, border places and have effectively created the illusion that these people are not here yet, even though they, in real terms they actually are. The government says no, they're contained on the border. So essentially, the damage that's done in these places is a sop to the demands of certain Australians to, who are opposed to their entry. The very physical construction of detention centres speak to this. Remoteness in de deserts, distant islands and bleak industrial suburbia speaks not just of secrecy and silencing, but of rejection. Electric fencing, coils of razor wire, that speaks of violence and aggression. Double perimeter fencing and patrolling and head counts by security guards who are paid enormous sums of money by our government to do their dirty work speaks of containment and control. And we must ask, what speaks of care? What speaks of refugee protection? In each detention centre is a confluence of individuals fleeing a myriad of life-threatening circumstances, a multiplicity of voices, opinions, reactions, histories, religions, ethnic backgrounds, stories, fears, experiences. But in the immigration detention centres, they find themselves entering Australia, being placed in these places and conceived as one thing, one entity, the refugee. Viewed collectively, they find they have become perceived as one living, breathing exemplar of something that Australia hates and fears. Something of concern in my masters and of concern to researchers and others in Australia and something that Assad has just touched on is not just what the effect of detention is on individuals while they're in detention, but what is the ongoing effect. So besides mental health issues, there's also ones of belonging. Once they are out, once they have their protection visa and possibly their citizenship, how long does the stigma of being a refugee, the stigma of the mode of their arrival, linger with them? So has the government so contaminated the public perception of what it is to be a refugee that it is a shameful thing now? I asked a refugee who is now a citizen, he's a published writer and he, he works with um, refugees as his job, um, when do you stop being a refugee? And he said to me that as long as the government maligns people, as long as they are continually in the media and continually spoken of in such degrading ways, I can never stop being a refugee. In a study by Lisa Hartley and Farida Foster on refugee belonging up at um, Curtin University Centre for Human Rights Education, they found that pe the longer people were in Australia, the less likely that they, they felt, the less hopeful they felt that they would belong in Australia. 
many of the interviewees said that they did not believe that white Australians would ever accept them as Australians. And one man talked about being pulled over by the police and the policeman said, where are you from? And he said, I'm an Australian. And he said, no, you're a citizen, you're not an Australian. So we have to not only ask, ourself, ask ourselves what is being done to refugees by our treatment of them when upon entry we treat them as criminals and we lock them up and we, we vilify them, but what is being done to our community as a whole? As our compassion and commitment to human rights erodes, what will we be? So we come to the question, what can we do about it? And at RAN we can test mandatory detention and other inhumane refugee policies and practices such as people on bridging visas not being allowed to work, people being sent to offshore detention and so on by a range of methods. We demonstrate through protests, marches and other actions. We hold public forums. We hold film nights and vigils and stalls and try and speak to as many people as we can to counter the misinformation that they constantly receive through the government and through the media. And we try to connect with refugees in detention in the wider community and share their stories and share and help them get their, their voice out there. We run petitions, have people sign postcards and letters to communicate to the government that there are many people in the community who are dissatisfied with the inhumanity towards refugees and who demand something better. So we go to, and we go to um, immigration detention centres to protest. So there are many ways that people be can become part of a broad movement in Australian society to affect change. And it can be done. It has happened in the teeth of extreme vilification, where we had an end to offshore processing for a while. We have had um, places like Woomera closed down altogether and TPVs ended. So change can occur. And everything people do to contribute to the campaign can have a profound effect and a lasting effect on asylum seekers that you come into contact with and asylum seekers overall. We all have a range of skills and contacts and ideas and at RAN we welcome them all and we welcome you to bring those along and to contribute. It, um, I, it all seems so hopeless for a lot. I know we're doing a lot, but how can we progress things to speak a lot, especially for that gentleman, for example? Um, who are you asking? So oh, is the question of very Everyone, important? I don't know. <laughs> I think the best thing that we like individually that we can do is, you know, let people know about mandatory detention and what it does and that there are avenues that you can oppose it. And like I suppose another avenue is getting involved in the network and finding a way that you can contribute to helping refugees, which can be which can be a variety of things. Um, but like, you know, it's it's gonna be a broad movement, it's gonna be collective action and people everywhere taking a stand up at stand like taking a stand against this policy to make a difference. So but that means, you know, us individually sort of getting active and doing things about it. Mm -hmm. People can visit in detention and people can um, you know there's a, there are a range of um, programs that we do and protests that we do that, that address this. I think it's important too, as well, to not feel like um, if we don't win the entire war, we're not making any ground. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of small wins that are really important. And even just the difference that you can make in the heart of an asylum seeker or in their, mi their mindset by knowing that we are out there. I mean, we, are constantly hearing from people, you know, just knowing that you were out there and you cared or I saw the photos or when we were out at Yonge Hill Detention Centre and, you know, the, the architecture is such there that you can't, they can't see us. And so we devised a range of ways, including people were there, well, they will know we had a freedom banner and, and, we, and we tied huge balloons and raised it up. So like, you know, like a hundred metres in the air or something so that they could see the freedom banner. And we, we heard from the people inside that they saw that and it meant something to them. And you know, all those little things are important. So while overall it may seem hopeless, I think the important thing is to keep doing each little bit and to keep being creative, spreading the word amongst your friends and people you know, getting involved in, in, in different actions. And I think all of those things do make a difference, even though sometimes it feels like the road is just getting a little bit too long. Uh, yeah, it was more of a, of offering some suggestions or an observation is that um, it does, the campaign does feel hopeless and people who are sympathisers to asylum seekers and hostile to the harsh policies do 
feel that they're alone in their opinions and they're outnumbered. But this is an illusion in itself. Some research done by Anne Peterson, um, Associate Professor Anne Pe Peterson at um, Melbourne University. She's a social psychologist. Um, and she took people who identified as not liking refugees and surveyed them, and people who identified as sympathetic to refugees and surveyed them. And the people who were sympathetic to refugees, and, and across a broad survey, it turns out about somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of people in the Australian community are actually hostile to these anti-refugee policies. They would like to see a much more humane situation. So that's a quite a significant minority, 20 to 30 percent. Um, are, you know, steadfastly hostile to the current policy settings. But when you ask those people, um, how many, you know, how many people do you think agree with you? They will say, oh, I about ten percent of the population. Mm -hmm. So the twenty or thirty percent that don't agree with the policies think, think that only ten percent agree with them. But if you ask the people who are rusted on hostile to refugees, which again is quite small, ten to fifteen percent, really rusted on hostile, and the rest of the people in the middle there are just, you know, being a bit sheep-like and following the what they hear on the media. But if you ask the rusted on hostile people, how many people do you think agree with you? I will say, oh, 80% of the population agrees with me. And this is because it's not, there's an overwhelming support for these, these horrible policies. It's because the dominant voices, the most powerful voices, the politicians and the large elements in the media are repeating that message. And so everybody thinks that that's what everybody thinks, but it's not true. And so our job really is to galvanise and mobilise those people who do agree with us to amplify our voice and to push back against those dominant voices. Uh, I'm just wondering if anyone knows how Tamils are received in India, considering that India is so close. Yeah, well, and, um, and I could just ask you as well. Um, sorry, do you do you wish that you had gone to another country instead, and that your family <laughs> were trying to get to another country instead of Australia? Like, do you think there are better options yeah. for people to go to? And you know, considering oh, yeah. that the politics at the moment is it is it a good thing to advise people to go somewhere else until? Australians become more caring towards refugees. Yeah, so uh, this is, uh, it reminds me of detention center because a friend of mine, he came back to me, he was, his uh, claim uh, for protection was refused. And then he was told that you have to go, instead of coming to Australia, you could go to Iran, live over there. But uh, we can go to Iran, we can go to Pakistan, we can go to many other countries over there, but we are still being treated as illegal person, and they don't give us a nationality. And they treat us, for example, in Iran, there have been many cases like this. They don't put this in writing because it's an evidence against human rights, um, and also it's a violation of human rights. But they, for example, an uh, Iranian man is accused of a big crime in the country, he, uh, he has a lot of money, he is going to buy an Afghan to replace him to go and he get hanged and then he's free. So we are facing those kind of situations over there. We have been to Pakistan, we have, Hazaras are still even in Burma, Hazaras are in Tajikistan, in Uzbekistan, in Turkey, and many other European countries and Middle Eastern countries, but they are still treated the same. So the, the reason that we come to Australia is for a safer place, whether it's to live a respectful for life. Thank you. Um, in terms of the um, the Tamil issue, um, d there's a, a section of India called Tamil Nadu where there have been refugee camps for a very long time. At the moment, India is saying Sri Lanka is safe and you, you can all go home now. Um, it, it was, it's been a very difficult, um, like living in those refugee camps is very difficult for people for a long time. They're, they're, the education access is very limited. Um, they're, they're not supposed to work and like, you know, most jobs are, are limited to them and they, you know, there's many abuses by, by police and officials and so on. Some of the people we're visiting at the moment have uh, are fleeing Tamil Nadu for, for these reasons and because um, India is threat threatening to send them back to Sri Lanka where they have no homes anymore. Their homes are gone and they have no family there anymore. And you know, there would be very, a, a great risk of persecution when they return. Um, so, so some of the people we're visiting at Yom Hill who have been told, oh no, you do, don't engage our definition. And, and we've been able to get them lawyers 
to um, to get injunctions and get their deportation. Some of these people live, have lived on Tamil Nadu for like 19 years, 25 years. Mm. So like, you know, when people say, oh, these people are queue jumpers, how many years do you have to live in a refugee refugee um, camp in another country, you know, I mean, the puts lie to a lot of these assumptions about the whole queue jumper concept. You know, most people that we met have lived in a third country or have lived in very precarious circumstances for a very long time. And um, and so that no advantage policy is, is really ridiculous in, in the face of that. But again, the, the government is controlling that discourse and it's very hard to get that message out there. Um, I might end on that note because we're running close to time, but there are plenty of, um, if, if you would like to um, stay around, we have snacks and so on up the back, and if you'd like to discuss these issues further, there's plenty of Refugee Rights Action Network people here to talk to. I'd encourage people to sign up on our contact list if you're not already on it, um, also to join our Facebook group and keep in contact with what's going on with, with RAN locally.